Yeah, just wait a second because the FLDs are adding up. I'll give it one minute. Um, All right, so it looks like people were added in. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, CS201 uh, um, remotely today. Uh, uh, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for today, um, Yisheng Zhu. Uh, Yisheng is a professor at Purdue, professor of computer science. Uh, he did his uh, PhD at Cornell. And a while back before Cornell, when he was an undergraduate student at uh, Peking University, he actually was here at UCLA visiting us for a summer uh, for an internship. He liked it enough. He came back and spent a few months and did his undergraduate thesis at UCLA in my group. I'm very happy. He did actually some fantastic work and uh, some really good contributions as an undergraduate and that undergraduate thesis. And uh, we're happy to have him back now as a professor. So uh, uh, before I, so welcome back, Yi Chang. And before I turn the um, uh, things to you, let me just mention that uh, we will keep uh, the questions till the end. You can uh, type your answer uh, through the QA uh, uh, feature. Uh, Yi Sheng tells me that in the middle of his talk, he's a little bit of an interactive part. So you may want to interact with you directly through the QA. So I'll leave that part to him. Uh, but aside from that, we can get started. So welcome again, Yi Sheng, and um, I turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for the uh, introduction. And uh, as I, uh, you know, as Anand said, that, you know, I was an undergraduate uh, exchange student uh, visiting UCLA. Uh, and at that time, I was uh, exposed to this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, very important, uh, uh, you know, pillar in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, this automatic reasoning. And, uh, uh, you know, since then, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, went to Cornell for a PhD and then uh, started my uh, job as an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at uh, uh, Purdue University. Uh, so this is uh, Purdue is in Indiana, so close to Chicago. Uh, and as you can see that, you know, today my talk is uh, Vertical Reasoning Enhanced Learning Generation and Scientific Discovery. Uh, so it actually uh, still has, uh, you know, very deep uh, impression and very deep mark, uh, uh, you know, that's actually traced back to all the way uh, to my exchange, uh, to my year as a uh, exchange student uh, here at UCLA. Uh, so uh, let me get started. So um, okay. So uh, so uh, intelligent systems uh, needs uh, the integration of uh, learning and reasoning. So machine learning and automatic reasoning are two fundamental pillars of artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and I think you know most of you are are familiar with what machine learning is. Uh, it is a bottom-up approach, uh, which means you learn predictive models from the data. Um, it is often very challenging uh, to provide formal guarantees uh, for machine learning models. Uh, and the learned models may violate constraints, uh, especially in real and unseen situations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, automatic reasoning is a top-down approach. Um, so automatic reasoning usually uh, you know, uh, incorporates um, you know, uh, approaches such as satisfiability solving, uh, constraint programming, uh, you know, mixed integer programming, uh, linear programming, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are all top-down approaches, which means you start, uh, you need to start from problem descriptions. Um, and uh, this often leads to rigid models, uh, meaning you do have to agree on the problem formulations uh, before you solve them. And uh, so these kind of models may be difficult uh, in the adaptation uh, if you have changing data distributions. Um, so uh, I really believe uh, the uh, grand challenge uh, for next generation artificial intelligence is in the integration of automatic reasoning and machine learning. Uh, and that is also uh, where my research lies. Um, so why do I say so? Uh, well, uh, here is a simple uh, task, okay? So imagine you are a kitchen remodeler 
And uh, here is a kitchen, uh, the image of a kitchen, and you are given uh, input specifications. Uh, the specification is to add a blue microwave right of the oven and add a green toaster left of the oven and below the sink. Uh, to accomplish this task, uh, you actually first need to locate, you know, where is the oven and where is the sink. Uh, and this for human beings uh, is accomplished uh, is a perception task and is also uh, is often accomplished by uh, this uh, so-called system one or the fast thinking cognitive system for human beings. Uh, so I'm using basically the terms uh, in this book thinking fast and slow as an example. Um, but uh, simply using uh, you know fast thinking does not uh, accomplish this task. Uh, to accomplish the task, you actually need a little bit of uh, systematic planning and generation. Uh, so this, uh, for human beings, uh, corresponds to the so-called system two, uh, slow thinking, uh, cognitive system. So uh, in terms of human brains, it's actually uh, executed in a different part uh, in human brain. Uh, so this uh, planning and generation, so you actually need to reason about uh, these, uh, the locations of these objects to be generated in relation uh, to these existing objects, in relation to the sink and the oven and so on. Uh, and for you, you also need to put these objects in their most reasonable locations. Uh, so for example, here, uh, you know, this toaster, uh, you know, usually is put on the table. Uh, it does not go to the floor or it's not hand in the air and so on. Uh, similar for, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, microwave. Um, and so uh, this, uh, um, you know, for the first step, it's typically a learning step, it's a perception task. It's typically today can be solved using machine learning. Uh, but the second step, the planning uh, and the generation, uh, it is, uh, you actually need, uh, you know, this uh, combination of learning and reasoning uh, to accomplish uh, this task. So uh, the question is, uh, will a complete constraint reasoning approach work? Um, so what this task is very difficult. Uh, the reason is you have this kitchen as an image, right? So uh, it contains very rich visual information. Uh, and so it's just very difficult uh, to encode uh, this visual information as objective functions, constraints, and so on. Uh, so, so uh, you know, complete uh, constraint reasoning approach does not work. Um, now, will a complete machine learning approach, a complete neural generation approach work? Um, so here I'm showing you a image uh, of a, uh, that is actually generated uh, by this stable diffusion model. Uh, so this is uh, one of the very popular uh, neural generating uh, tools. Uh, and this neural generative tool take the input uh, as these uh, you know, specifications in the form of natural language uh, and this existing kitchen environment. Uh, so what you see that what it does is it generate a uh, you know this a very busy kitchen. Uh, it's a very nice uh, environment. Has a lot of appliances. Uh, it's also nice and cozy. Um, but uh, basically, uh, you can see that it's actually ignored. Uh, basically, ignored the the specifications. Uh, just generates a very nice kitchen. Uh, on the other hand, our approach. Um, you know, uh, it is actually an integrated reasoning and learning approach uh, is able to, uh, you know, generate this picture uh, that first you have these uh, appliances uh, placed in their correct locations. So this actually satisfy the input specifications. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they make, uh, you know, this image make minimal modification to the existing image. Uh, and also the uh, objects are generated in their reasonable locations. So you don't have a you know, toaster flying around. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, these image look good in quality. So uh, how does our approach work? Uh, it is, as I said, uh, the embedding uh, of this spatial reasoning uh, in the neural generation that makes uh, you know, the whole approach work. Uh, the whole approach has three steps. The first step is a perception step. That basically you have this neural perception module uh, that actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, that actually, uh, you know, uh, locates this existing object. Uh, then it's accomplished by the second uh, spatial reasoning module. For this module, uh, it is a neuro symbolic integrated approach 
that actually decides uh, the locations of these objects to be generated. Uh, so uh, for this work, uh, we uh, use bounding boxes uh, to uh, decide uh, these uh, locations, uh, the, the, the object locations uh, to be generated. Uh, and uh, how this works is you have this uh, recursive neural net uh, that actually generates the co coordinates of, the, of these bounding boxes. Uh, in deciding one coordinate of this bounding box, it basically iteratively half the range of this coordinate until this is become sufficiently small. Uh, the decisions made by this recursive neural net uh, are filtered through a constraint reasoning approach. And this constraint reasoning approach basically checks uh, if the decisions made by the recursive neural nets, uh, they violate uh, spatial constraints. Uh, if they violate, uh, then uh, these, uh, you know, the constraints reasoning uh, engine is going to ask the um, the recursive neural net to wind the decision, so basically to go the uh, other way uh, and make, uh, you know, other decisions. Uh, so in this case, uh, this neural and uh, symbolic integrated approach is able to generate these uh, bounding boxes uh, that satisfy user specifications. Um, then in the search step, uh, these bounding boxes are filled in uh, with this visual elements generator that actually generates these uh, individual appliances uh, in, these, uh, in their uh, correct locations. So again, I want to say that, uh, you know, in this way, we can produce images that satisfy uh, user specifications uh, while the baselines cannot. So uh, my research has been, uh, you know, uh, in the last five years, uh, I have worked on a diverse uh, set of domains ranging from design generation, language generation, AI-driven scientific discovery, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a consistent theme uh, of my research of integrating automatic reasoning and machine learning. Uh, so in today's work uh, or talk, I'm going to use three examples. Uh, to uh, show you that reasoning can uh, enhance neural generation, uh, it can expedite scientific discovery, and help solve satisfiability module counting problems, integrating symbolic and statistical AI with provable guarantees. Um, so this is a relatively long uh, introduction, uh, and it also includes the first uh, application. Um, so uh, I hope uh, that the uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, actually keeps you entertained. Um, and uh, let's leave the, uh, the, the, the questions uh, till the end of the talk. Um, and, uh, you know, I am going to, uh, you know, go to the, uh, the second part, uh, which we use uh, automatic reasoning to expedite uh, scientific discovery. So, um, over the years, uh, there has been very, especially in the la last decade, there has been very exciting progress uh, in deep learning with a lot of applications uh, in science domains. Uh, you know, these deep neural uh, approaches also made fantastic progress. Uh, so here I'm basically showing you AlphaFold uh, as an example. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's not restricted in biology, uh, you know, these AI-driven scientific discoveries driven by neural networks has, uh, uh, you know, made advancements in many, many different uh, domains. Uh, however, I'm still arguing uh, that human learning or human scientific discovery uh, still lead uh, AI-driven scientific discoveries in a lot of ways. Uh, why do I say so? So if you look at these famous examples, Isaac Newton, uh, Maxwell, Einstein, uh, their discoveries are driven by active explorations with purposes. Uh, they are able to learn from incredibly small set of the surprising or boring examples. Uh, so if you think about Newton, um, he, is, uh, he discovered the law of universal gravitivity uh, simply by looking at, you know, uh, apples falling from trees. Uh, so for most of us, uh, these are quite boring examples. Uh, but for Newton, uh, you know, uh, he discovered the law of universal gravitivity. Uh, these are interpretable, elegant uh, mathematical equations uh, that can be applied uh, to almost every corner uh, of our universe. Uh, so I argue that still up to date, uh, AI-driven scientific methods are not able to do that uh, quite as well. Uh, so the question is, uh, what can AI learn uh, from human scientists? 
Um, for that, I'm going to use symbolic regression uh, as an example. So this is the task of learning symbolic expressions uh, from experimental data. Uh, they are very good benchmarks for uh, AI-driven scientific discovery. Uh, if you really think about what Newton has been doing, uh, you know, he is basically discovering, uh, you know, this law of gravitivity from experimental data, which is, uh, can be characterized as this uh, symbolic regression task. So um, there has been a lot of uh, symbolic regressors. Um, so uh, here is my crude summary of most of how most of these uh, uh, symbolic regressor works. Um, they follow this the so-called horizontal path. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? So I'm using, uh, you know, this uh, discovery of the ideal gas law as an example. Uh, so, uh, so most of these approaches they start with the guess uh, of this uh, uh, possible ideal gas law, uh, and typically, uh, you know, the first guess is not correct. Um, so what they do uh, is they start to modify uh, their um, you know, initial hypothesis uh, until, uh, you know, they find a good equation that uh, actually fits the experimental data very well. Um, now, if you think about their approach, uh, this kind of approach can be very challenging. Uh, this is really because there are many equations uh, that involve these four variables, the pressure, volume, uh, number of gas molecules and temperature, um, and uh, if you want to, you know, uh, keep doing this, uh, the, you know, the trace of this will be, you know, you, you need to actually uh, reason about, find a lot of equations before uh, you can actually converge to a good uh, equation. Okay. Um, so what we propose here uh, is this vertical discovery. And this vertical discovery actually coincides uh, with the scientific approach. Um, so what we do here is we first, in the first step, uh, we hold all the variables as constants, uh, and we only allow two variables to vary. Uh, so in this case is the pressure and volume. Um, and we carefully vary one variable and see its effect on the other variable, and we figure out that these two variables are, if they, you multiply them, it becomes a constant. Uh, then, uh, you know, once you get this reduced form equation, in the next step, you add one more independent variable. So in this case, it's the uh, number of gas molecules. Um, and then uh, this gets expanded in the search step uh, by adding another independent variables and so on and so forth until you find the, the full equation. Um, now, uh, if you look at this approach, at least in the first few steps, uh, the search is in these reduced hypothesis spaces involving subsets of independent variables, uh, and the hypothesis space is a lot smaller uh, than the full hypothesis space. And therefore, we believe that uh, you know this kind of vertical discovery can supercharge existing AI-driven scientific discovery approaches uh, to in modeling, uh, you know, this in discovering these kind of equations with. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with very complex uh, structure and many independent variables and complex scientific processes and so on. So um, just to, uh, you know, prove my point, uh, this is the interactive uh, activity. So uh, here on the left, so if you look at uh, the table on the left, um, uh, there is an equation uh, that maps the input. Uh, the input is x1, x2, and x3 to the output, okay? So there is an underlying equation that maps the input to the output without any noise. Um, so if I don't uh, tell you uh, what the equation is, uh, can you uh, figure out this equation? Um, I actually, I cannot see the Q and A. Uh, so you, you guys can, you know, if you see the equation, if you figure out the equation, you can type uh, in the Q and A. Uh, and uh, uh, Adnan, can you help uh, trace if there's any input uh, in the Q and A or chat? Yes, we'll do. But nobody has figured it out yet. Okay. Um, ah, so actually, we... uh, wait. So- Oh, there is one x1 plus x3 parentheses multiplied by x2. Ah, that's a very good guess, okay? It's very close. 
to the correct equation, but it's not the correct equation. All right, that's that's what I have. Okay, so so this may be very difficult. Okay, so uh, let me uh, simplify the problem. Uh, what if I ask you to only look into these rows? Okay, so um, you know, figure out an equation that works for these rows only. Uh, so, if you are interested, you know, you can type in the Q and A and what is an equation. All right, someone is saying add x1 and x2 together. Someone is saying that doesn't work. Uh, the x1 plus x3 is correct. Ah, actually, there is that answer. I was going down, and one of yeah, them is yeah, 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 yeah. The x1 plus x3 is correct. Okay, so if you look at 2.5 plus 9.5 is 12, 1.8 plus 3.2 is 5, and so on. Okay, so um, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, x1 plus x3. So how about these rows? Uh, can you now tell me an equation? Uh, silence. Till now. So uh, okay, there is a new answer. Yes. X, X3 minus X1. Yes, that's the correct equation. Um, so 4 minus 3 is 1, 2.2 minus 4.2 is uh, minus 2, okay? So that is the correct equation. Very good. Okay, so uh, how about, uh, you know, now we have discovered that on the red row is this x1 plus x3, and on the blue row is this minus x1 plus x3, and then x2 is held as 1.0 in the red row and held as minus 1.0 in the blue row. Uh, now I need an equation that's working both cases. So, uh, so it needs an equation that's, can you guys tell me an equation okay. that's working both so cases? I have a- Okay, uh, we have uh, many correct answers. Okay, so the correct answer is- so, Isha, one. Uh, are you able to see the QA? Yes, I, I, I pulled okay, out. Okay, so I will uh, get out because I thought you can't. I'm helping you with it. Go ahead. All right. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. Uh, yeah. So uh, the correct equation is uh, x1 times x2 plus x3, okay? So here you have 1 times x1 minus 1 times x1, and it just happened to be at x2 is 1.0 in the red case and minus 1.0 in the blue case. So it's very possible that this 1 minus 1 is actually x2, and that is indeed uh, the ground truth equation. Okay, uh, and uh, so uh, so um, you know, uh, let's go through this uh, you know this process again. Initially, it's a very difficult problem, uh, at least without a computer. Uh, so what we have been doing here uh, is actually the vertical discovery that we have talked about. Uh, that what we have been doing here in the red and blue row is actually hold this uh, um, you know this uh, value of x two. Uh, as constants, okay? And once you hold this as constants, you take this out of the picture, and now you are working with, uh, you know, simpler, way simpler problems that you only need to worry about this x1 and x3, okay? To, you know, the relationship of x1 and x3 to y. And that is a lot simplified, and that allows you to actually, you know, figure out this equation uh, without the help of a computer. Um, so uh, our idea, so this is uh, the idea, and our uh, algorithm is basically an implementation of this idea using AI. Uh, so what we do here is, uh, you know, we start by holding all the variables as constant and only allow one variable to vary, okay? So in this case, we only allow this x1 to vary and hold x2, x3, and x4 as constants. Uh, we use uh, genetic programming uh, to fit an equation um, predicting the y uh, from the single input variable x1, okay? Uh, now, the actual algorithm that you use to identify this equation is not important. Uh, later on, we tried other approaches, including, you know, deep reinforcement learning and so on and so forth. Uh, they work uh, even better. Um, you know, it's just happened to be that genetic programming was used in our first approach. 
Um, now, but the, the core thing here is, uh, you know, because the mapping only involves X1, this is relatively easy. Uh, and therefore, genetic programming can identify this equation with this single input variable. Uh, then in the second step, what we do is we add one more variable to vary. So we allow X2 to vary. And then we ask genetic programming to grow, to extend uh, from the equations identifying the first step and extend this into a new equation that involves two variables. So in this case, x1 and x2. Um, now, because the extension only allow one variable at a time, uh, so the extension usually is not that big and therefore genetic programming can usually uh, you know, ex uh, do the correct extension. Uh, and then this has been, you know, uh, you know, uh, further extended in the third step and fourth, fourth step and so on and so forth until you find the full equation. Uh, experimental results show that, uh, you know, we are able to find equations with the smallest regression errors uh, compared to a bunch of baselines. Uh, these are both, uh, you know, using genetic programming and or, uh, you know, deep reinforcement learning uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, I may not have time uh, to talk about this part, so let me skip this part uh, just to keep in time. Uh, so we ask this question, uh, you know, whether uh, our approach uh, is able to uh, scale up, uh, you know, learning partial differential equations uh, from, uh, uh, you know, experimental data. And for that, uh, you know, we consider uh, learning this uh, dendritic solidification model uh, and this is uh, dendritic solidification in the physics process of uh, governing basically the form of a snowflake. Um, and uh, it can be actually described by this very complex, uh, you know, partial differential equation. Um, for these experiments, we only learn the parameters uh, of this partial differential equation. Um, you know, actually we are still working on, you know, having an AI model to be able to identify this, the form of this partial differential equation. Um, but uh, what we did was we split uh, these parameters to learn uh, into the blue group and the red group. Um, first, we uh, you know, uh, come up with this experimental data in which the blue uh, parameters, they have no effect uh, on the spatial and temporal dynamics uh, of these uh, uh, this, uh, partial differential equations. Uh, so we fit the models with uh, data of this, this type, uh, this allows, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, these uh, models to learn the focus on learning the red parameters. Uh, and then in the second step, uh, we actually, uh, you know, expand the learning uh, to include both the red and blue parameters. Uh, so this is uh, actually to implement this uh, high level idea of this vertical uh, learning idea that so first we you know, kept the learning uh, in a subset of parameters, and then uh, we expand the learning to all the parameters. Um, so this is the experimental result. So this is the simulation of the ground truth model. Uh, if you learn all the parameters at once, uh, so basically you learned uh, this uh, dendritic solidification model. It's still a solidification process. Um, but uh, you basically uh, see these models that, uh, you know, form a snowflake with the wrong number of petals. Um, but then uh, if you use this vertical learning experiments, um, you are basically able to uh, discover the ground truth model. So you are able to learn uh, this, uh, the, the form of a snowflake, um, just like the original snowflake. Um, so I talked about vertical symbolic regression. This is the, ta uh, the idea uh, that in incrementally builds more and more complex equations from simple ones. Uh, and I show that, you know, this idea actually helps uh, uh, for scientific discovery. This is learning partial differential equations uh, from experimental data. So what I really want to talk about uh, is traditionally uh, this symbolic regression, uh, this particular task, uh, is, uh, you know, strictly uh, restricted, treated as a learning task. Um, it is because, you know, for this kind of task, uh, the input is data, uh, the output is a model, uh, although the model is, a, um, uh, is in the form of uh, partial differential equations, but still uh, the, um, you know, the, the output is a model. Um, so, Uh, 
um, um, now what we have been doing here uh, is to bring uh, these, um, uh, you know, uh, what we have been doing here uh, is to bring uh, this active reasoning uh, into uh, this uh, uh, this uh, equation. So uh, the reasoning actually reason about. So in fact, you don't have to uh, learn the full model upfront, right? It's very challenging uh, to learn the full mathematical equation upfront. Uh, and so what we have been uh, doing here uh, is to use automatic reasoning to decide what are some intermediate uh, models uh, and their, you know, the, the experiments that can help us uh, learn these intermediate models. Uh, and um, this can be identified uh, using uh, either human reasoning or automatic reasoning. Uh, and we believe by incorporating automatic reasoning uh, into learning, uh, this will close the loop uh, and this will further expedite uh, AI-driven scientific discovery. So, um, let me um, start uh, for the third part of the talk. Um, so, for the third part of the talk, um, you know, where we work on this um, uh, using reasoning to uh, scale up, uh, you know, satisfiability module counting problems, uh, integrating symbolic and statistical AI. Uh, with provable guarantees. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to present this part uh, following the um, you know the actual process uh, that we discovered uh, this um, uh, you know uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, this model. Um, so back in 2020 and 2021, we discovered that automatic reasoning can enable learning with provable guarantees. Um, for that, we work on uh, Markov random field models. Uh, so these are highly inferential probabilistic models with a lot of applications in computer vision, natural language processing, bioinformatics, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, the famous paper, conditional random fields, uh, this may uh, this paper received over eighteen thousand citations. So this is one of the most widely used uh, probabilistic model in the field. Um, however, the uh, the inference and learning of Markov random fields are intractable. Uh, so here I'm basically showing you uh, this, um, uh, you know, this problem of uh, finding the maximum likelihood estimation for Markov random fields. And uh, so you can see that this kind of model has this uh, computation of the partition function, uh, and uh, uh, you know you don't have to know what partition function is, but basically you can treat this as a gigantic sum. Uh, that involves summing over an exponential many uh, probabilistic scenarios. And this uh, this sum is embedded in an optimization problem. Uh, and so this actually makes this problem highly intractable, uh, you know, way more difficult uh, than MP-complete uh, problems. Um, we uh, came up with this X or CD algorithm that uh, is the first algorithm that converges in linear speed uh, towards the global maximum likelihood estimations uh, for macro random field models. Um, here, uh, we don't mean by, uh, you know, this linear speed doesn't mean that it is a linear algorithm. Uh, it is a stochastic gradient descent based algorithm. Uh, but in every stochastic gradient de descent step, we have to solve an MP-complete problem. Uh, so this uh, still is, uh, you know, is quite expensive. Uh, but uh, you know, this is the first algorithm that can give us, uh, you know, provable guarantees uh, that we know that it is converged uh, in linear speed towards the global maximum likelihood estimations. Um, so similar uh, successes, uh, we look at this uh, stochastic optimization problem. Uh, this is the you know, most important problem that is uh, very crucial uh, problems for decision making under uncertainty. Uh, the problem we have been looking at is this um, uh, you know, stochastic optimization problem that uh, you know, finds uh, you know, optimal policy interventions that maximizes or minimizes a stochastic uh, function. Uh, so this problem is also highly intractable. Uh, we come up with the first uh, algorithm that has this linear convergence rate uh, towards the global optimal. Uh, similarly, we look at games. Uh, so this is a leader follower games in which we have a leader committing strategies before the followers. Uh, also, this is known as Stackelberger games and uh, it has been the enabling theory 
behind many uh, you know uh, applications in computational sustainability and in AI so for social impact. Uh, we consider these quantum response games. Uh, these are the games in which both the leader and the followers they take uh, they act probabilistically and they have exponential large action spaces. Uh, and this leads to exponential size uh, mixing in social programming and is also highly intractable. Uh, we come up with the first algorithm that converges in linear speed uh, towards the true Stuckerberg equilibrium. Um, after seeing this many successes, uh, you know, we ask ourselves, uh, you know, what we have been doing. Uh, so uh, what do these problems have in common? Uh, it turns out that all these problems uh, involve both symbolic reasoning and statistical reasoning. So they are the integration of symbolic and statistical AI. Um, now, or to put it another way, uh, if you have a sense solver that can reason about probabilities, uh, then you can solve all these problems, okay? Uh, so because of that, uh, you know, we propose this satisfiability module counting uh, as a new language, uh, unifying sim symbolic and statistical AI. Uh, basically, this satisfiability module counting uh, solvers uh, adds a new module theory, and the module theory is probabilistic inference uh, into satisfiability solving. Uh, so the satisfy uh, SMC uh, decides the truth of these Boolean formulas uh, that involves predicates whose values are determined by probabilistic inference. Uh, so here, uh, model counting, uh, weighted model counting, is just another name uh, for probabilistic inference. Uh, you can show that uh, you know you can use uh, model counters to actually solve uh, probabilistic inference problems. Um, so uh, what does a satisfiability module counting problem look like? So uh, here is an example. Uh, find me a hotel, so my expected walking time uh, to triple AI and to one of the two cafes is no more than 30 minutes. To actually reason about this problem, you actually need uh, to basically reason about the expected uh, uh, you know, walking time from the hotel age to triple AI. You want the expectation is less than 30 minutes, uh, but then you actually need to concatenate these expectations uh, with N and O's. Okay, so this is how this uh, satisfiability module counting problem look like. These are basically probabilistic reasoning predicates connected with uh, and and or and not, so these logic operators. Um, so uh, to reason about these expectations, you actually need a probabilistic inference. So you actually need to, to reason about these random uh, variables, uh, and uh, this leads to these um, model counting problem that uh, needs to you know, uh, sum over an exponential many probabilistic scenarios. Uh, now, if you use uh, you know, these uh, functions, uh, this abstract function to represent this sum, uh, then you can simplify the writing a little bit, and then you introduce some uh, indicator variable. Uh, and then uh, in the end, uh, the problem that you are getting is basically this kind of problem that you have the Boolean part, uh, which is basically a Boolean formula. Uh, but then you have uh, the values of a few Boolean variables are determined uh, by model counting, by probabilistic inference, okay? Uh, and this is indeed the, uh, the problem that we are looking at. Uh, so you see that this, uh, this uh, satisfiability module counting problem has this symbolic part uh, and also the statistical part. Uh, so this is basically, uh, you know, these problems that integrates the two AIs. Um, so for uh, the paper, um, for the approximating algorithm that we develop, uh, we actually uh, solve a slightly re relaxed problem. So we replace this bi-directional implication with this one-directional implication. Um, but for the applicational domain that we considered, um, all those applicational uh, domains can be solved by solving this relaxed version of the problem. Um, the uh, the algorithm that we consider uh, is this uh, is a very interesting algorithm. So the algorithm first transform this uh, intractable, highly intractable uh, satisfiability module counting problem uh, into a set formula. Okay. So in fact, if you look at what's happening in this blue box, uh, is basically this transformation. Uh, there's no uh, solving uh, yet. Uh, and then uh, in the uh, you know in this orange uh, box uh, we just use a standard set solver uh, 
uh, to actually solve this uh, set viability module counting problem. And if the uh, you know if the SMC uh, if the set solver returns uh, satisfiable, uh, then we actually return true. Otherwise, we return false. Okay. Uh, the uh, the probabilistic uh, uh, approximation uh, the uh, guarantee we can get is this constant variation guarantee, uh, which basically states that if the original SMC formula, the satisfied module counting formula, is satisfiable, even if you tighten the the model counting the the probabilistic inference uh, 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 you know constraint by a multiplicative constant. So here, two to the C is a multiplicative constant. Um, if the, uh, the uh, SMC formula is satisfiable, even if you tighten this by a multiplicative constant, then this XOR SMC algorithm will, with high probability, find the satisfiability, uh, satisfiable uh, solution. On the other hand, uh, if the uh, SMC formula is not satisfiable, even if you uh, relax uh, these um, probabilistic um, uh, bounds by a multiplicative constant, uh, then the XOR SMC algorithm will highly likely deny that there exists a satisfiable solution. Okay, so we can get uh, you know probabilistic bounds on both cases. We can get constants of permutation bounds, uh, both the upper bounds and the lower bounds. Um, so why can we get uh, these, um, uh, you know, these uh, these bonds is actually leveraging an interesting connection between model counting and a solving set problems uh, with randomized XOR constraints. Uh, for that, I'm going to use unweighted model counting uh, as an uh, illustrative example. Uh, this is to count the solutions to a set formula. Okay. Uh, now, probabilistic inference is weighted model counting. Uh, so there is ways to, uh, you know, transfer this unweighted model counting in uh, weighted model counting into unweighted ones. Uh, but for that, we are not going to um, cover that in this talk. Uh, so actually, uh, if you want to count the number of solutions to this set formula, uh, these are the two solutions. Okay. And um, now these are not exciting. What is exciting is if you write. Uh, all the XOR constraints uh, that involve these two variables, X1 and X2, okay? So here are all the XOR constraints. Um, and then for each of this model, for each of this solution, you decide uh, whether this uh, model satisfy or violates this XOR constraint. If it's satisfy, it's a one, otherwise it's a zero, okay? Uh, an interesting fact to note is if you look at every row, uh, exactly half of these uh, numbers are ones and half are zeros, okay? Which means exactly for every solution, it satisfies exactly half uh, of the solutions of this set uh, of these XOR constraints uh, and violate the other half, okay? Uh, now, why is that interesting? <clears throat> it's actually because um, if you randomly pick up a XOR constraint from this set of XOR constraints and you focus on a particular model, so a, a particular solution, um, <clears throat> then you get 50% of the chance this particular solution will satisfy the, uh, the, the, the randomly sampled XOR constraint. Okay? Uh, or to put it another way, if you add uh, if you can conjunct uh, the original Boolean formula with an XOR constraint, a randomly sampled XOR constraint, then this in expectation will filter out uh, half of the, the solutions of the original Boolean formula. Okay. Um, why is this an in interesting fact? Is because suppose I want to count the number of solutions to this f of y. Okay. I want to know. Uh, whether f of y has more than two to the three, which is eight solutions. And here I'm using red dots to mean these solutions, the models, uh, and blue do dots means uh, these are not solutions, okay? And I want to count if there are more than two to the three, eight models, okay? So what I can do is I can start concatenating uh, the original Boolean formula with this randomized XOR constraint, 
I know that I add one XOR constraint, I, in expectation, I filter out half of these red dots, okay? Uh, I can do this once, I can do this many times. In fact, I can do this three times. And suppose after three times, uh, you know, I still have these red dots left, which means, uh, you know, this formula, this formula of concatenating this f of y with three xors is satisfiable. Then what does that mean? It means this step, it has one red dot. It means at least in the second to the last step, it at least has two red dots. And then it means uh, in this step, it has four red dots. And then in the beginning, it has eight red dots, right? So this means that, um, you know, uh, if this uh, formula is satisfiable, okay, uh, then highly likely in the beginning, we have, uh, you know, more than two to the three, uh, you know, solutions, two to the three uh, red dots, okay? Uh, vice versa. If we start with less than two to the three, eight uh, red dots, then after three filters of this type, highly likely you are left with a, you know, no red dots, which means that this uh, formula is not satisfiable, okay? Um, now, why is that an interesting fact? Is because this is the satisfiability module counting problem that we are dealing with. Uh, we have this intractable model counting embedded in this whole formula, and this whole formula is highly intractable, okay? So with this trick, this allows us to replace this intractable model counting uh, with this set formula, okay? Uh, and this will transform the entire formula into a single set. Uh, and then uh, we can use the standard set solvers uh, to determine the satisfiability of this uh, set instance and get approval guarantees. Um, so experimental results demonstrate that our approach outperforms the existing approaches in terms of solution quality. Uh, this is expected because we, have, we are a, uh, you know, uh, a, a method with approval guarantees. Um, but also it outperforms uh, in terms of time. Uh, and this is really uh, thanks to the rapid development of set solving uh, in the last uh, uh, decade. Uh, this is another domain of robust uh, supply chain design. Um, all right, uh, so let me conclude. Um, so I talked about, you know, vertical reasoning can help enhance neural generation. Uh, and vertical reasoning expedites scientific discovery, and the vertical reasoning solves the satisfiability module counting problems uh, with guarantees. Uh, what I really want to talk about uh, is uh, the integration of reasoning and learning multiplies the power of them alone. Uh, so if you look at both human beings, human brains, uh, and these um, you know, AI um, agents, um, you know, both human uh, human beings and AI agents, they need both reasoning and learning uh, to perform, okay? Uh, and um, uh, so in last year, there has been this famous quote, and it's by Yana Kuhn, uh, that basically critiques that one of the limitations of large language models uh, is that this large language model cannot reason, okay? Uh, since then, uh, you know, we see that, uh, you know, we have been introducing, uh, you know, the interfacing these large language models with coding interface, uh, with web interface, and so on and so forth. Um, what I really uh, seeing is, uh, you know, this is trying to uh, add to large language models a certain level of reasoning capabilities, uh, which I think is a good start. Uh, but I think, you know, I have convinced you that, you know, a deep integration of reasoning and learning offers way more. So uh, you have seen examples that reasoning generates design satisfying user specifications, experts uh, dice learning in scientific discovery, and solve SMC with constant information guarantees. Um, so I really believe that, you know, the integration of reasoning and learning is a very rich domain. Uh, you know, I certainly was very happy uh, to work in this domain, um, you know, starting my year uh, here uh, in UCLA. Uh, and since then, it has been a very fruitful domain uh, for me to thrive here. And I think, uh, you know, looking into the future, uh, especially with the introduction of large language models, um, you know, these domains are going to be uh, even richer. Uh, and I certainly think uh, that, um, you know, this will be one of the, uh, you know, uh, very 
um, you know, important uh, uh, branch of uh, research for the entire artificial intelligence domain. So, all right, uh, with that, I'm going to stop here uh, and uh, take questions. Thank you, uh, Yi Chang. First, uh, big hand to Yi Chang. I don't know, you probably can't hear it. Uh, so yes, we have time for the, uh, questions and discussion. Uh, uh, please, if you have questions, um, do type them to the Q and A. There's already a pending question, Yi Chang. Maybe you can handle it because it's manageable. I saw a couple of people raise their hands. So if uh, you want, also feel free to uh, just let people ask their question directly. But there is a question at the end of the Q and A. Maybe you can start with that. Okay, uh, let me start there. Okay, uh, are you simply given a table of data or do we have a black box that's implement the function? Uh, Richard, this is a very good question. Uh, so for scientific discovery, uh, we do have a, a black box, uh, have a data oracle uh, that can, uh, you know, give you the uh, the output uh, for these um, for your queries. And the queries are these control variable experiments in which you have uh, ver the variables held as constants, uh, and that is, um, you know, the data oracle allow you to query more data. Uh, that is indeed a uh, a limitation of our approach. So, uh, you know, the other approach that we compelled with most of these approaches, they direct treat this as a learning task. So they just uh, work with a fixed data set. Uh, we cannot work with a fixed data set. We, we need this data oracle. Uh, uh, we are able to, you know, hold these variables as constants. Um, and, uh, um, but I want to point out that, uh, you know, for scientific discovery, uh, in real applied science domains, um, you know, these control variable experiments are actually the bread and butter that uh, allow us to query and learn these very complex uh, processes. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the conclusion we draw here is uh, basically suppose uh, you have uh, this, um, you know, uh, very uh, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, this ability to conduct the scientific the, the experiments, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, hold variables as constants, um, then uh, we can leverage this idea, this, um, you know, vertical discovery idea to actually scale up, uh, you know, and expedite scientific discovery. So that's our bet. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, you know, there are applications that you have to work with uh, fixed data sets. Uh, in that case, uh, probably uh, we can use counterfactual reasoning to actually reconstruct, you know, what may be uh, the response of the system uh, when you hold uh, these uh, variables at these given configurations. So that may be some uh, ways to go there. Um, uh, but, you know, it's worth actively looking to. Uh, but uh, in that case, uh, if we cannot do that, uh, then, you know, existing uh, approaches uh, have their own uh, benefit uh, in dealing with this fixed data sets. Uh, also, I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, our approach uh, can supercharge almost all existing approaches um, if, we can get access to these, uh, uh, you know, uh, active scientific experimentation. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, these these approaches, uh, you know, those approaches that Thanks. work with there is another data. question. Yeah. So, oh, there is another question. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. But when you finish, but it looks like you finished. Uh, yeah. You saw it. Yeah, so so I, I'm going to ask uh, answer the next question. Uh, in the AI science discovery section, how do you determine which order to learn the parameters? Does it matter? Um, Jonathan, it matters a lot. Uh, we actually later uh, published a follow up paper uh, that uh, actually showed that uh, varying, uh, you know, this uh, variable order leads to orders of magnitude difference uh, in the quality of the. Um, uh, the in in the quality of the models learned. Um, so uh, and we have been working on. Uh, you know, we first uh, came up with this. Uh, you know, genetic programming uh, algorithm that lets multiple different schedules compete 
uh, on you know what which is the a good order uh, and also we recently have been working on another idea that uh, uh, you know, leverage reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo tree search uh, to search a good variable order. So it does matter and it changes the, uh, you know, uh, it can, you know, improve, uh, further improve the experimental results by orders of magnitude. Okay, so. Right, uh, very good. So uh, I, I have a question, Yi Chang. So uh, among the various applications um, you worked on, you, it looks like you tried different domains. Yeah, which one is the most challenging technically? Which one is most challenging technically uh, in the a lot of domains that I have been working? Uh, I think is the uh, uh, you know the uh, the um, the material science domain uh, that I I uh, you know I briefly mentioned. Uh, so this is to uh, you know characterize the nanostructure evolution. Uh, in this materials under heavy irradiation and high temperature. Um, and uh, so there, uh, it's first, it's a scale in terms of scale that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, you actually need to simulate these very large scale um, systems that involves millions or even billions of, uh, you know, elements. Uh, and at the same time, you want to learn scientific knowledge in the form of uh, mathematical equations. Uh, so it both needs uh, interoperability, and also it needs uh, you know large scale uh, reasoning and learning. So, uh, right. uh, so and, and yeah. since I mean the second part of this question, because when people talk about integrating learning and reasoning, mm -hmm. there are different setups in which you do that. As far as um, what needs to be integrated in intuitive terms? What do you think is the most influential area as far as impact in terms of, I'm not talking about approaches, I'm talking about where would integrating reasoning and learning will tend to have the biggest impact? Like discovery is an example, but what other examples? Yeah, Any discovery is certainly an example. So. Here, um, so, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a scientist uh, in NASA this morning, in fact. Um, so uh, he basically tell me that, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you have this, uh, you know, this um, deep neural nets that can, you know, predict, uh, you know, the weather, you know, amazingly well, right? So 100% accurate. Um, you know, it's not useful. Uh, what is useful is, uh, you are able to decompose these weather systems into simple, uh, you know, into several physics processes, um, and uh, you are able to understand that um, in simple terms. This allow people, especially, uh, you know, policymakers uh, and or, uh, you know, for example, you know, like pilots, uh, to actually reason about, you know, what if there is an, a small, um, you know, uh, error uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in, you know, modeling this, uh, you know, the where the uh, the high pressure system is, where the low pressure system is, and so on. Uh, what the system will change? Um, so if we, and and this kind of um, you know uh, knowledge can only be, um, you know, uh, reasoned when you. Um, decompose the system into this uh, form that is um, uh, it's uh, the composition of several you know basic uh, systems and you can reason about that individually. Um, another application that is can be enormously benefits is uh, you know in high stake domains uh, where you have uh, you know uh, for safety domains uh, that uh, uh, you know you you cannot afford. Uh, to have uh, AI make mistakes. Uh, and so in that case, you really want, uh, you know, this uh, to give approval guarantees uh, for these kind of uh, systems. Uh, and uh, uh, and I think that's, you know, for example, in autonomous driving, in the you know, medical domain, and, uh, you know, all these domains are, uh, you know, incredibly important uh, to give approval guarantees uh, that, that shows that you know systems at least have a lower bound on, you know, on, on its performance. Very good, very good. So it's basically the the first part is understanding models and phenomena instead of just replicating their predictive abilities. Um, very good. So I I don't see other questions here. So um, 
uh, I guess we'll have to thank you, Yi Chang. Thank and you. Yes. You who made it uh, online on such a short notice. And um, thanks, everyone. I guess we're we're done. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adnan, for hosting. All right. Bye-bye.